Morning, everybody. Y'all stand with us. Glad you're here today. Welcome to Community Baptist.
you see my victory when all I see is the mountain you see the mountain move. and as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, so when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. In every field, I lay at your feet, and I'll sing through the night. No, God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty, yes you do. When all I see is a cross, God you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my The battle belongs to you in every fear I lay at your feet and I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you Almighty fortress you go before Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, and I'll sing through the night. No, God, the battle belongs to you. No, God, the battle belongs to you. you back a minute with this song. I know you all know it, so sing. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow turning with thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. As Thou hast been, Thou forever will be. Great is Thy faith. 
faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. And all I have needed, thy hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness. Great is the 
Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness to us yesterday, today, and forever. God, ask that if there are those in here that don't know the comfort of having your faithfulness wrapped around them, God, that you would speak to them today, whether through this music or through the message coming up. Jesus, we know that you're, you're here with us. And we welcome you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You want to have a seat? Glad you're here today. Welcome to Community Baptist. If you've never been here before, we'd love for you to get connected. You can do that by scanning this QR code on the screen behind me. That'll take you to our website. You can grab our app, get connected. We also encourage you to join us for our Wednesday night activities starting at 630. Got something for the whole family. Come join us for that. Um, we're going to receive our offering now. You can either drop it in the atrium on your way out today, or if you want to be fancy, you can use another QR code and give online that way. And now it's time to dismiss our kiddos. If you have a kiddo with you, they can jump and follow the rest of these kiddos right out these doors. We have an amazing program for them this morning. Don't be shy. Give it a try. Women's Brunch coming up on February 18th at 10 a.m., which is a Saturday. All ladies and girls invited. No men. Sorry, dudes. Y'all can do this pancake cook-off the next day at 8.30 on Sunday, 8.30 to 9.30. Show up, eat pancakes. It's going to be great. And then on the 22nd, from 4 p.m. to midnight, uh, we're going to do the Community Beats Cancer Relay for Life at Veterans Memorial Park. If you want more info on that, you can text Courtney, 214-205-2058. And now, we have an amazing video for you. Check this out. Lights on me. All right, thanks, Steve. Yo, Steve, fist bump is out, man. Really? What's in? <laughs> cool. <laughs> Refreshingly smooth Bud Light. Always worth it. Nice job in there, Larson. You saved the account. You got your game skills down, Pat. You might have your hands full once I'll pick up the control over. Put the hands on my mama. Keep your hands on my Doritos. Jason, are you playing guns? Yeah, you're right. Just your typical Super Bowl car ad. Right? Or a hilarious beer ad. <laughs> or whatever ad this is. Whatever. But... It's a tie, Dad. What? It's a tie, Dad. What makes it a tie, Dad? There are no stains. Look at those clean clothes. What else would this be an ad for? Diamond? A 
gift that lasts for an hour. Time. It's time for a cold refreshment. <laughs> Try that. Fall into the sleep of no. Time. No. Die, die. Extreme. No. Time. Tide. Meet the all new. No, it's a Tide ad. Tide. So, does this make every Super Bowl ad a Tide ad? I think it does. Watch and see. Super Bowl. It's a holiday, ain't it? I can't believe we showed a beer commercial on at church. Bunch of non-Baptists. Growing up in the 70s, can't remember not being a Dallas Cowboy fan. Easy, 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 no hecklers. Cowboys had gone to a Super Bowl when I was three years old. You remember, Brian? The first ever, and we lost 16 to 13. Following year, we won, beat the Dolphins 24 to 3. I don't remember those games because I was too young, but man, I got nostalgia just reading up on it. My dad was a big old Cowboys fan, and of course, he passed on that love to me. I don't quite recall those Super Bowls, but I knew they were a big deal. As I got older, my, my days, good days and bad days, or weeks, would be based on whether the Cowboys won on Sunday or not. Can anybody relate? Well, I can. <laughs> Man, we got some hecklers today. Normally, I just get them on uh, emails. <laughs> I'm getting them live today. <laughs> that was me. Later on in the 70s, I was a, a young 10, 12 teenager, 10, 12-year-old and a teenager. And literally, my days or that week were based on if the Cowboys won or lost, my joy, my peace, my happiness. Fortunately, in the 70s, they won a bunch of games. Amen. Glory to God. A lot of Super Bowls, five Super Bowls, only won two of them, but one of them was against the Denver Broncos. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a wonderful thing? Uh, and, but anyway, and two, we were cheated against the Pittsburgh Steelers. But anyway, that's a different story. We were robbed. For those of you millennials, Gen Zers, Gen Xers, I feel sorry for you. You don't have a clue what it feels like for the Dallas Cowboys to win a Super Bowl. And I truly feel sorry for you. The Super Bowl, it's coming, though. Trust me, it's coming. Yes, closer and closer, it's coming. Y'all are non-believers. I get that. There's a reason why there's a hole in the stadium at the Cowboys, the old one and the new one. You want to know why? So God can watch his team. What's up? That's right. That's right. That's his team. The Super Bowl is among the most watched single sporting event in the world. Second only to, and I don't get this, second only to the UFA championship. It's even more watched than the World Cup. Can you believe that? Yeah, it is. But the European Soccer Champions League has more viewers for some reason. I think there's a miscount there. Europeans have a tendency to mess things up. The top seven most watched broadcast in American television history is the Super Bowl. The top seven ever. And three of them are the Dallas Cowboys. What's up? What's up? Come on. Come on. What's up? What's up? Raise the roof. God's team. It is the second largest event for food consumption, only behind guests, Thanksgiving. We're going to eat a bunch of food today, a bunch of food, more than any other day of the year except for Thanksgiving Day. Today's not going to be any exception. I plan on eating a lot of food since, um, no, I'm not going to go there, Helen, I'm not going to say it. I'm really, really close to being normal again. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> well, I, well, I was stationed in Germany. Yes, I served my country for five glorious years, three of those in Germany. The Monday after the Super Bowl, 
was considered an unofficial holiday for all U.S. Armed Forces. So they would give us Monday off because the game would come on so late that we would be up till 3 or 4 in the morning. So they would just say, you're off on Monday, which we absolutely loved. During the Super Bowl broadcast, something else has happened in the last maybe 30 years, perhaps, and that's commercials have become the non-football aspect. Of. A lot of people will watch the Super Bowl for the commercials, and y'all got a glimpse of some of them. Some of them are pretty funny. Some of them, companies just wasted their money. It's expensive. I mean, I'm talking for a 30-second clip. It's like $2 million. That is an expensive, expensive advertising bit. Commercials have become an integral part of the event. For the vast majority of the nation, me included, it doesn't matter who wins or loses. Life goes on regardless of who wins or who loses. I feel sorry for Kansas City and Philadelphia Eagles fans today. I could care less. I'm kind of pulling for Kansas City because uh, around here, we don't like Philly. You hear what I'm saying? We just don't like them. They don't like us either, which is fine. I've been to that godforsaken city. I don't know why people live there. <laughs> Y'all awake this morning? Sandwiches? Oh, Philly cheesesteak? Oh, good one. That's a good dad joke. David would appreciate that. He likes them jokes. See, David thinks I'm not a, I don't have a sense of humor. But little does he know, I got something up my sleeve. It's coming here in a minute. I'm thinking and thinking and thinking while I'm recovering. And thank you, church, for your patience. Thank you, Doug, for filling in for me for several weeks now, back in November and then here recently. Uh, I'm very grateful to you, church family, for allowing me to recover and to get healed, and I'm rapidly on my road to complete healing physically. I feel good. I really do. I haven't felt this good in years. It is believed that I may have had that tumor for up to 10 years. They don't really know. It was the size of a fist. That's a big tumor, and it really was uh, wreaking some havoc. It's amazing that I was still the pleasant person that I was all these years, Miss Alice. I mean, I was just still a bundle of, hey, you got a little one up here. It's awesome. Uh, but anyway, um, thank you. Uh, but in thinking about, okay, I'm going to come back eventually, if y'all let me. I'm going to come back eventually. And so because of the way things worked out uh, on planning and things, I said, man, I'm going to be back on Super Bowl Sunday. So what can I possibly share with you on Super Bowl Sunday that's just different, different than what we've been talking about? And so I started thinking, how am I able, how can I give an encouraging yet challenging word and tie it into the Super Bowl? How can I tie in the single greatest sporting event in our great nation to a Sunday morning message? So I started pondering on the thought is, how can I live the very best life that I can possibly live as if the Super Bowl was every day? Can you imagine, can you imagine if we lived our lives every day as if it was the Super Bowl and it was our team that's playing and our team that's going to win? Can you imagine? How do I get up every morning of every day and not just say this, but actually live it? This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, the proper pronoun here in Scripture is we. We will rejoice and be glad in it. But I personalize it. I will rejoice and be glad in it. So how do I live my best life? Well, we have Jesus. We have our family. We have our church family. We have our health. And I have my health because, like I said, I haven't felt better in years. It's been possibly more than a decade. We have each other. Yet many of us still choose to live an okay life. Do you ever ask someone 
or someone asks you, hey, how's it going? Hey, how's your day? And this is a normal response to many of us. It's going. Normally what that means is it's not even okay. It's just kind of going. But if this is the day the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it, then it's more than just going. It's more than just all right, or the way the kids said, I, I'll be I, or the classic one, it's okay, I'm okay. Let me tell you something, joy is a choice. Can I say that again? Joy is a choice. But guess what else is? Misery. Misery is also a choice. The author of Hebrews, and we're going to be in, in Hebrews chapter 12. And I'll, let me read in verse 14, and then we'll unpack that, and we'll go somewhere else, and then we'll come back to it. How's that? Pursue peace with everyone, starting in verse 14, and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Ouch. Oh, oh, that, that should reverberate in you. It's like, what exactly does that mean? A lot of theology there that we won't get into. I'm going to focus in on something else. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and the root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and by it defiling many. Make sure that there isn't any immoral or irreverent person like Esau who sold his birthright for a meal. For you know that later when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected because he didn't find any opportunity for repentance, though he sought it with tears. You know what that tells me right there, that passage? He felt bad for what he did later. He felt bad. He sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. Now, Miss Kathy, there ain't no soup good enough to sell your birthright over. There ain't none. Even if it's a bowl of menudo. Are y'all with me? Who in here likes menudo? Mitchell, you've never had menudo in your life. You're from like Ohio. I mean, he sold his birthright. But then this passage is saying, hey, he came back seeking or searching for repentance with tears. So guess what? Just because you get busted or you get caught and you want to repent and you're showing all the boo-hoo, that doesn't mean you're going to uh, uh, get uh, forgiven. All right? He still lost out on his blessing because he came, he came at it with tears and God's like, too bad, too sad, see ya. Okay, you, you felt like a bowl of soup was way more important than your inheritance. And now you're going to come at me boo-hooing. Can you imagine? I mean, some people don't like to realize this. But I think sometimes God, God does that to us. Oh, God, my life sucks. Everybody sucks. Johnny sucks. The world sucks, and, I'm, and I got crocodile tears coming, and, and I go to God, and I think God's up there like, who are you again? <laughs> I haven't heard from you in months. Praying at meals doesn't count. Moving on. So much theology, like I said, that we can dissect here, and there is. But basically, the author of the Hebrews, the writer, is warning us on rejecting God's grace, the joy of, that, God, that comes with God's grace, God's peace, God's pl uh, blessings, God's inheritance. Esau's daddy was Isaac and his mama was Rebekah. He rightfully had the birthright all to himself, but he chose something else. He ch for whatever reason. He chose okay, ladies, listen to me. He chose okay instead of the best. And for many of us, and I'm talking to you Christians, followers of Jesus, we do the same thing most of the time. 
We choose okay. We choose to settle. Now, 28 years ago, Angie settled on a husband. She settled. And she's been regretting it ever since. But guess what? She's stuck. She's stuck now. All right? She doesn't see this fine specimen of a man that you see before you. She doesn't see that. You do, but she doesn't. So, so she chose to settle. <laughs> we choose to cancel ourselves. Now, don't mistake this. Life happens. Stuff happens, right? Bad things happen. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. The storms hit us all, right? Whether we're living for God or we're not living for God, it happens. James, the writer of James, the half-brother of Jesus, a slave of God, James chapter 1, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes and the dispersion. Greetings. <laughs> I like how he says that. Hey, man, I'm about to bust on you, man, but greetings. Consider it great joy. My brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, but endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. What a tough pill to swallow. James, a slave of God. Right there, right off the bat, James is like, man, I am completely and utterly sold out to Jesus. I'm a slave. Can't even say that word these days anymore, slave. It's got such a negative. You know, even Disney's tapping in on all this stuff. Here's my political rant for the session. I haven't been here in a few weeks. So bear with me on this roller coaster ride. Disney's coming out with a show, something about slaves built this country or something like that. Something about the 1613 project or whatever. I'm like, all right, Ovilla Road's about to get chewed up. They're about to expand that bad boy to six lanes. This farm to market road is going to be a serious road. All right, I'm going to I'm 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 venture out and say this. The people that are going to be working on the concrete and the electrical and the conduit and the, and the asphalt and the, all of it laying down rebar, that's my people. Come on. <laughs> Let's be real. If anybody built this great land of ours, it's my people, Robert. Come on, Robert. You're in the industry. You're in the business. Come on, man. Let's be real. Disney should come out with saying, Mexicans built this country. <laughs> Are y'all with me this morning? Can I get a little bit racial for, for a change instead of letting society dictate? You know, white people are so, so uh, consumed with the idea. You got, y'all are so scared of being accused of being racist. Y'all are even scared of having a brown person talk about the race issue. Because y'all are like, oh, I don't want to laugh because uh, I don't want to be deemed a racist. And that's what's happening. Can't even use the word slave. Can't even. Talking to youth pastors here recently about fundraising. They're starting to fundraise for camp and whatnot, for mission trips, all right? And there used to be a thing called slave auction. Y'all remember that? Older folks, slave auction. They can't say that anymore because everything's so politically correct, slave auction. We can't say slave auction. I'm like, ain't your church like an all-white church? He goes, yeah, that's why. White people get mad at that. I'm like, come on, man. It's a fundraiser, man. Let's get off this race trip. All right, don't let Disney start dictating policy on, you know, who we are, what's our identity. I'm like, they've never had any bearing on what. You know, I remember back in the day, Brooke was little. Our boys were even littler. We were all in the Disney movie, all up in Disney movies. She had them all memorized, just like many of your kids. There was a family at the church we were at. They were totally against Disney movies. And they were from California, Myron. Can you believe that? Lived across the street from Disneyland. At least. They were probably right there next to the castle. Nurse, Nurse Weinstein, whatever. And they were against Disney movies. And so I would tell Brooke, I said, Brooke, uh, Lion King, don't talk about it. 
Why, Daddy? I like that move. I'm like, yeah, but people don't like Scar. He's evil. Simba, they don't like talking animals, okay? It's not biblical. I know, right? I know, right? But why argue it? You know, so everything was like walking on eggshells. Somebody, somebody's like, hey, well, I'm against this. I'm against this. I'm against this. I'm like, well, be against it, bro. Be against it. All right? We're going to respect that. But I'm not against it, okay? We're going to watch Lion King's. Singular, Lion King. All right? But anyway, so you lost your job. Consider it great joy. Been there, done that, right, babe? My marriage is suffering. Consider it great joy. My kids, parents said amen. My kids are making poor choices. Nobody's kidding here. Consider it great joy. I got a fist-sized cancerous tumor in my colon. Consider it great joy. I may have to wear a colostomy bag the rest of my life. Consider it great joy. Thank God I don't have to wear one anymore. My wife asked me the other day, hey, how does it feel to be able to tuck your shirt in? I'm like, glory to God in the highest. I get to tuck my shirt in. And actually, it looked pretty good. Y'all like this drip? Like the drip? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brady, don't be laughing, dude. I, I mean, I see you. Consider it great joy. Can you imagine the joy that I felt the very first time I was able to tuck my shirt in? Because I hadn't been able to. It's a little thing. Consider it great joy. And I don't know about you, various trials doesn't mean except for fill in the blank here. Well, that doesn't include some of the stuff I've gone through. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess the word of God was written to everybody but you. Consider it great joy. When we understand the context of this passage, these Christian Jews of the early church literally were running for their lives, hiding from their oppressors. Meeting in secret for fear of arrest, for fear of persecution, and in many cases, fear of execution. Pretty sure those are some of the most serious, various trials. We don't have various trials in America. Let's be real. We don't have various trials compared to the first century church. It's relevant. I get that. Somebody said to me, well, it's, it's, it's a different kind of persecution. It's a different kind of oppression. It's a different, I, I get that. But we're still free to meet and broadcast live on YouTube and everything else. We're still free to do that. These people weren't allowed to even visit each other for fear of all that. So I beg to differ. So then Pastor James the very first pastor of the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. Like I threw that in there. Uh, how do you know it wasn't Lutheran? Like, I don't know, man. When you're at a Lutheran church, say that. Presbyterian, say that. Consider it great joy. Consider it great joy. So, here we are. I'm going to give you some practical tools on this lovely Super Bowl Sunday to help us truly live our best life. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? And first and foremost, I'm talking to myself, and I already talked to myself. There's many. There's a lot. And I'm not going to venture into the practical ones like love God, love people, read your Bible. Pray, smile, give. Okay, those are understood. Let's, let's make that clear, right? That's understood. Many of you in here, if not all of you, give. You give of yourself. You give of your time. You give of your money. You love graciously. You love all that good stuff, right? But why are you living an okay life if that's you? If it's not you, then Share it with somebody else that isn't. It is my belief that the majority of professing believers, professing Christians, are living okay lives. 
So if the title of my message was how to live an okay life, you'd be like, yeah, come on with it. No, how are we to live our best life? In addition to where we already are, talking to you Christians, right? Talking to you believers. Many of us, many of us choose to live in misery, yet we profess Jesus. We choose to live in, in, a, in a realm of woe is me, yet we profess the King of kings and the Lord of lords, which doesn't equate, doesn't match. We choose to say this, but then we choose to live another way, a way that is not joyful. Come hang out with me every day of the week, 24-7, and I'm not a spiritual person, and you will find that out after about five minutes. But one thing you are going to see about me is what you see is what you get. We're going to have fun. We're going to have fun. I can spend a lot of time, and, 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 and this is convicting, laughing at some of the stupidest things. Like the other day, I got, I got to watching these reels, TikToks or whatever, and this one guy was inside of a cooler of a convenience store, and when a person would open the door to grab the drink, he would squirt them in the face with, with a water gun. <laughs> and I watched that for like 10 minutes. I'm like, this is hilarious. Why didn't I think of this? Because I'd be that guy. I'd be like, come on, man, come on. <laughs> hey. And then people are looking. You can't really see because it's dark inside that walk-in cooler. And you're like, <laughs> that'd be so mean. I'd blend into the dark so they couldn't see me unless I smiled. I mean, it'd be, it's hilarious. You know, that's me. Somebody say, well, you're you're so immature. I'm like, whatever, man. Whatever. Listen. Listen. These are practical tools to help us, help us truly live our best life. Number one, stop complaining. (gasps) Ouch. Ow. I didn't come to church to hear somebody say, stop complaining. Stop speaking negatively around others, especially your kids. Stop letting them hear how horrible life is. Stop telling them how much lack of money you have in the bank. Because what will happen is, is those same kids will equate joy with money. Last time I checked, Robert, we don't serve God and mammon or money. So if, we, if our kids keep hearing us, man, Angie, do you remember with the kids? They didn't have a clue we were poor. No clue. No clue whatsoever. They thought ramen noodles was like a feast. They thought eating cereal all three square meals was like heaven. They thought... They were always eating Frosted Flakes when they didn't realize that Angie would buy great value and put it in the Frosted Flakes box. Same thing. Same thing. Look at all this drip. Look at all this drip. Nothing name brand right here. Nothing. Where's the swoosh? Any swoosh on here? Where's the swoosh? Now, I like some name brand stuff. All right, but it better be on sale. But look at this. I mean, you look pretty good, man. Pretty handsome fella. I like that hat. Moving on. Stop complaining. Stop letting your kids hear how horrible life is because you're broke. They're going to equate joy with money. Number two. This one's also me. Listen twice as much as you speak. Amen. Glory to God. Mirror. You ever heard this saying? God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. Listen twice as much as we talk. (laughs) Well, that one hurts. That hurts. Think before you speak. Oh, often I think after I speak. It's when I do my best thinking. Listen to people. Hear them out. Get both sides of the story before you draw conclusions. Hello. I've had people, probably still to this day, get mad at me over what they heard. And not one time did they come and ask me, 
Not once. I give those credit that do. I love it. I love it. I love it when people come in my office and say I suck. Because at least they're telling me the truth to my face. Remember, remember, what keeps me going is my doubters, my haters. Every time I get a negative comment or a negative email or a negative text and I get those two, that means they got my number, I'm like, yes, yes, it's a badge of honor. It's a badge of honor for me. But hey, try this, try this. Listen, hear people out. How about get three sides of the story? Your side, their side, the truth. And, and instead of drawing conclusions, how about we draw no conclusions and give it to God and move on? Keep scrolling. You don't like what somebody posts? Keep scrolling. If you allow me to troll you, that's your fault. Because here's the thing. Getting offended is a choice also. I'm going to throw that in. It's not in my notes. It's a choice. If you get offended, you chose to get offended. You could have kept scrolling. Kept on. You know what I'm talking about, right? So I demonstrate, you know. You got it? Are you sure? Some of the wiser generation don't get it. You just keep scrolling. You get on Facebook. You don't like that? Oh, wait, I'm on the, I'm on the live. You just keep scrolling. Oh, wait, I can't do that one either. All right, you just keep like, well, oh, I don't like that. Oh, let me, let me keep. You see, you see how easy that is? Keep scrolling. Keep scrolling. But no, people want to be like, oh, there he is again. He did it again. Johnny did it again. I might have to send him a private message. I might have to confront him. How about we draw no conclusions and get all sides of the story, including the truth? Number three, don't tie your identity to things. Kind of goes with my first one. Stuff fades. Stuff goes away. Stuff gets taken away. Eventually, it all turns to dust at some point. I was in seventh grade. Kid you not, kids. I was in seventh grade before I realized that the Nike swoosh swooshed up. My mom apparently had bought me some shoes with the swoosh that went down from Payless. I thought I was styling. I'm like, man, I got me some swoosh shoes. But the swoosh was down, Robert. Can you believe that? She tricked me. My mama tricked me. He don't know I pay for it in them. He don't know. And so for the longest time, kids would be like, hey, man, why is your swoosh upside down? What are you talking about? That's a cool swoosh. Man, you messed up. Your swoosh is wrong. So is everybody else's then? Yeah, I guess so. Don't tie your identity to stuff. If you don't get over this one, it's going to eat you up alive, mom and dad. You're going to pass that on to your kids and going to eat them alive. And the misery you're suffering over this identity crisis that you're tied to, it's going to be passed on to your kids. Do you love your kids? Do you love your grandkids? Do you want them to have the misery that you're enduring right now? Then stop passing it on to them. Stop training them like that. Don't blame society. Don't blame TikTok. Don't blame Disney. Blame the, yourself who trained our kids. I've said this before, especially with my sons. The, 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 the weaknesses that my sons possess were my failures as a father. It may or may not be true. I can't shake it, though. I can't shake it. Could I have done something differently with my boys? Could I have, could I have encouraged them differently when they were growing up? Could I have done this? And, 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 I, and I own that part. Don't take it from me. That's between me and God. I own it. I own it. Okay? There are deficiencies may or may not have been a direct result of my parenting skills. Okay, I'm not trying to be a, a, a defeatist here, a self-defeatist, a self-condemner. 
okay, but I just got I got to be accountable to myself. Could I have done something differently as a father for my sons? Fellas, you could say the same thing. The deficiencies you possess could be a, at the very least, an indirect result of your father's. Over 50% of our kids today are growing up without their biological fathers. And you wonder what's going on with our society. You got boys that don't even know what gender they are. Roughly 30% of, of people under the age of 24 identify as nothing. That should shake us to our core. It's happening right here. Right here. In good old big time Ferris, Texas. And right there in good old big time Red Oak, Texas. It's happening right here. I spent a good portion of the afternoon at the high school. What day was that, Kendra? Thursday. I got stuck there because we had a crackhead that got loose. They wouldn't let me leave. Joffrey even said, "Uh uh-uh, no adults can leave. I'm like, I'm not the one they're looking for. I fit the description, but I'm not the one they're looking for. So I got stuck there, so I get to talking to kids, and man, and you know what? God orchestrated that because I got to talk to an individual that I would never got to talk to under any other circumstance. Wasn't even in the mentors program. We ended up in some science lab. And man, let me tell you, man, let me tell you, when you, when you get to listening to kids and their issues and their stuff and they trust you, man, do they unload. They unload. They unload truckloads. And if they trust you, be ready. Be ready. Be ready. They need us. They need us. You want to know why? Because home life ain't that good. They need us. Anyway, that was free. Number four, don't suffer imagined troubles. Stop saying things like, I can't, or I don't qualify, or I'm not good enough. I'm a nothing. I'm a nobody. These are imagined, imagined situations, imagined mindsets that we give ourselves. And the sad part about it is we pass it on to our kids too. You know, I used to, I mean, it, it seems like since I was little, I'm talking as a little kid, and this is a shame, but this is how some adults are in life. As far back as I can remember, I would hear the adults in my family say, he's not going to amount to nothing. He's not going to be anything. He's just going to be like all his other cousins and other relatives. He's going to walk around with an ankle bracelet by the time he's 15. That's what I would hear. I kid you not, I would hear this. And you know what? Most of our kids are hearing that today. It's It's amazing that they don't bust out. Those of you in the education field, you got to you got to realize if you got 20 kids in your class and 50 of them are crazy, 15 of them are crazy or a good number of that, I consider the home life. I consider what they got to go home to. Day in and day out, day in and day out. Got a phone call this past week. Some kid is homeless. And that's just the ones we hear about. And then the place where he's at that they took him in are a bunch of crackheads. So they're looking for a place for him to to live. He's a freshman. It's insanity. It's insanity. But this is what they're hearing. They're not going to mount to anything. How how are these kids going to become something when that's all they hear? If you're saying it about yourself, don't let your kids say it about themselves. Give them realistic, achievable goals. I used to get a kick out of some parents. My kid made the 12 and under select volleyball team because she's so amazing. She's like the apple of my eye. She's incredible. And I'm like, lady, take that off, please. She made the team when you wrote that $1,500 check. (laughs) Let's be real. Let's be real. People pulling their kids out of school, and if there's somebody here, I don't know anything about that. 
people pulling their kids out of school because the coach wouldn't play them, so they're going to move to another school because that coach is going to play them, and it increases their chances at a scholarship. Man, you should see their crossover. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Michael Jordan got cut from his sophomore team. The real GOAT, for you LeBron lovers, the real greatest of all time, his name is Michael Jordan. All right? It's biblical. He never lost the NBA championship. Let's get that right. Never. But he got cut. Mr. Jordan, oh, we're going to pull you out, son. Shoot, you're D1 caliber. No. No. He worked, and he worked, and he worked. He was the first one in the gym. He was the last one out of the gym. He worked, and he worked, and he worked, and now he's the GOAT. He hasn't played in 30 years, and we're still talking about him. Don't suffer imagined troubles. Encourage your kids to work hard and have fun. They need positive reinforcement, not unrealistic expectations. Don't tell them they're D1 athletes when deep down it's wishful thinking. Don't tell them they can sing on American Idol when you and I both know. I mean, we watch some of that. We watch some of the, what, what do we watch? The Voice. No, The Voice is pretty, pretty good. But some of them other shows were like Simon Cowell blast these people that can't sing, but they truly, truly in their hearts, they think they can. I'm a, I want to talk to their parents. I want to talk to your grandparents. I want to talk to your friends. Why are you lying to somebody you supposedly care about? If they can't sing, don't tell them that. Just say, hey, maybe, maybe you should try coloring books. Maybe singing just ain't your calling. You can say that nice. I've had a lot of people say, maybe pastoring is not your calling. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. The people that aren't, a lot of people that aren't left are very uh, encouragers. A lot of y'all were encouraging me throughout all these weeks, and I appreciate you very much. Thank you so much. Positive, realistic expectations, and I thank you. Number five, don't compare yourself to others. I saw this written somewhere. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but it sure does make sense. It has been said that the thief of joy is comparing or comparison. The grass is always greener on the other side. You know, I grew up in the hood, in Corpus. Um, and I noticed things. I noticed things about my neighborhood and the neighborhood over that had pretty similar houses. Just a different demographic. They always had nice manicured lawns, green grass, all that good stuff. And uh, I, I just saw the difference. My neighborhood had a lot of Yards that had no grass, cars on blocks. Well, my, my, my uncle's working on that car. I'm like, for five years now? Like, waiting on parts? I mean, Amazon wasn't back around back then, but I get it. Like, man, they're sitting on blocks. I'm like, you want to know why the grass is greener over there than it is here? Because you ain't working at it. Pretty sure Billy Joe Slush hit over there. Maybe waters it, cuts it, fertilizes it, does all those things. I complain about my backyard. I hate my backyard. There's no grass there and a bunch of rocks and a lot of Great Dane fertilizer. I'll leave it at that. But you know why I don't have good grass back there? You want to know why? No, kids, not talking about that kind of grass. All right, let's be real. Don't go there. We're in church for crying out loud. But you wonder why I don't have grass in my backyard, David? Because I'm not David Acock in my yard. This dude lives in his yard and he has people. He pays people to come and do stuff to it on top of that. One time I drove by and he's out there with scissors. His whole backyard like that. I'm like, what is? And then I thought, man, he's in trouble. <laughs> That's a good one. Up my sleeve. 
The reason I don't have grass in my backyard and it's be, because it's greener somewhere else is because I ain't doing nothing with mine. You want your grass to be greener? Cultivate it. Do something about it. Choose joy. Stop comparing yourself to somebody else's yard. Stop comparing yourself to other people's stuff. All right? They're in debt. 95% of Americans are in deep debt. I don't want to live like that, Robert. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live like that. I can only handle so much of my debt. Okay? You know, I'm so glad that at least something. Both my son's trucks are paid for. Paid for by them. At least we taught him that. At least we taught him, don't go in debt. And that's because we didn't have Dave Ramsey in our pocket. Now, Angie and Brooke, they're in debt. <laughs> they're in some serious debt. Nails, hair did, all that stuff. Moving on. <laughs> Number six, don't overindulge. Ouch. Don't overeat today, Brian. <laughs> don't overeat. I was going to say somebody else, but I pick on him too much. She's encouraging me, but I'm not doing it. I'm not going to talk about Joe. I'm not. Stop it. Don't overdrink. Oh, silence. Don't binge watch Netflix, especially during the ice age. Guilty. Don't binge watch The Bachelor. Dumbest show ever. Yeah, I said it. Cancel me, Facebook. That's the dumbest show ever. Stupid show. I hope y'all don't watch it. Do y'all watch that nonsense? Don't lie. You're in church. Oh, she tried? Okay, good. Watch what Paul said to the church at Corinth. Everything permissible for me. Everything. What does everything mean? Everything. Let's not try to sugarcoat it, Baptist. Let's not try to, to dissect it. Well, that didn't mean everything. Okay, theologian. Everything's permissible for me, but not everything is helpful or beneficial. Everything's permissible for me, said it again. But I will not be brought under the control of anything. You get that? So if it controls you, then it's bad. You're overindulging in it. You get depressed, you get anxious, you start eating, you're overindulging. That's, that's bad. Today is an exception. Paul didn't have the Super Bowl back then. You know what I mean, in moderation, right? Some Baptists hate to hear, I consume alcohol in moderation. But even then it's sinful because I'm a stumbling block. I said, you just became a stumbling block to me with that comment. How's that? There's so many natural, organic remedies that God placed on this planet for our consumption, for our good. But somehow we find a way to abuse his goodness. We find ways to abuse what God placed here. I believe every organic plant that he put here for medicinal purposes, we find a way to abuse it. I... I was given three different pain medications. One was a muscle relaxer, something like that. I had three. They're still in the, in the cupboard. I stopped taking them almost two weeks ago, before my staples got, came out. And the reason I stopped taking them, and I'm going to be very transparent, I can overindulge. Lots of people, millions of Americans are addicted to prescription pain medication. Let's be real. And I would venture to say that every one of us in here knows somebody that's hooked on that nonsense. There are wives that I met at this church who are praying for their husbands to this day about prescription drug medication. They're hooked. They're hooked. So before we condemn alcohol, before we condemn other things, 
Let's start praying for these people because it's legal. That's the sad part about it. They're hooked on legal stuff. I think they're obtaining them illegally. But who cares about legality? Let's be real. Let's be real. We're going to indulge whether it's legal or not. We do it. So many natural organic remedies out there. So many. But even with those, we've got to be really careful. I stopped cold turkey. I, with the, the pain. Actually, I would have taken them if I was still in, indulging in a lot of pain, but I started to feel better because I heal well. You know why I heal well? Because I have the great physician, the great healer that's taking care of me. All right? I am a walking miracle. I, sa- I stand before you. So if you want to blame somebody for me still being here, blame the one who made it all happen. I can say the doctors at Baylor, Scott, and White did a magnificent job, and they did, and they're amazing people, many of whom I know personally and are great people. I can say that, but it was still the great hands of the physician who said, I still need you down here. His healing hands were all over me. I'm healed. I I still have, uh, what's that called? Home health care people coming to see me. They haven't in a while, but, and they're, they are amazed at my recovery. Amazed. Absolutely and utterly amazed. I said, man, we got patients way younger than you, way healthier than you. I don't know what that meant. And they're still bedridden months later. I'm like, I ain't about that life. Choose. Choose, choose. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of my recliner as much as I love that thing. I got to get out of here. Choose, choose, choose. Living our best life is not just beneficial for us, but for all of those around us, all of those people that we love and care for, or we say we do, especially our kids, especially our church family. Living our best life is contagious. Sometimes I like to send this text out in certain situations. Smile, it's contagious. Smile. I was kidding with you the other day when I seen you hugging all kinds of people at the basketball game. But that's what you do. That's what you do. We embrace. I I love being out in the community and embracing, not really embracing people. I'll high five them, slap them. Hey, there's a new greeting. Pow. You know, I love it. I love it. I love getting to meet new people. Got some new people I met today. I haven't met y'all, but I will. I will, and, I will, and I'm going to. Because I love it. I love it. Choose it. Choose it. It's contagious. To be joyful is contagious. But to be miserable is contagious, too. Misery loves company. Have you ever heard that one? How come we can't say joy loves company? I'd leave you with this passage, and it hurts. It hurts. Is it 82 degrees in here? No. That is sinful and closer to the other place than to the other place. Make sure that you don't reject the one who speaks. Hebrews 12, verse 25. For they, if they did not escape when they rejected him, who warned them on earth, even less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven. You catch that passage? Remember, one of the underlying themes of this passage that we just read in Hebrews chapter 12 is rejecting God's grace. Rejecting his grace and everything that goes with it. Peace, joy, inheritance. Homeboy wrote about Esau. That's all about him losing his inheritance. Don't risk eternity's blessings with your nonsense of today. It's not worth it. It's not worth it for you. It's not worth it for your kids. Your kids, our kids, let's, just, let's personalize it. Our kids, our kids, our kids, our future, our kids, they deserve to see a smile on our face. Somebody one time asked me, hey, it was a psychologist, a a licensed therapist. She asked me, it was in Burleson, she asked me, hey, 
What are your thoughts on arguing in front of your kids? I'm like, I go, we sometimes do because it's um, an inevitable. You can almost can't uh, not argue, especially if you're on a car ride somewhere. I go, uh, what would you do about physical altercation? No, I didn't ask that. I go, you know, I never thought about it. She goes, here's is what I tell people. Let them see you argue and fuss and disagree. But let them also see you reconcile. Because if you never do, I've heard people tell me, I've been married 50 years, and my wife and I never argued, not one time. And the only thought that comes to my head was, gosh, did y'all live in the same house? <laughs> We are, like, actually together. <laughs> I mean, really, let's be real. I've seen some of y'all fuss, and it's, it's like, it's like, man, I'm kind of embarrassed, not really, but I'm like, give me some popcorn. Come on with it. It's okay if we fuss. It's what families do. It's okay if we fuss and fuss and fuss some more and disagree and disagree some more, but... Hello, let them see us reconcile. What a beautiful picture of the gospel. What a beautiful picture of family. What a beautiful picture of forgiveness. Choose. Let's choose. Let's choose to live the best life. Let's choose it. You want practical application? I don't know what else we can do. I think Robert Jeffers can take my notes and, and say it. And man, they'll write a book and he'll become a millionaire more so than he already is just practical stuff. Choose. Choose. Father God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for health, Lord. Many, many are recovering today. Miss Jenna, Brother Don. Father, many are recovering still from grieving. We got the Cameron family in, in Maypro still praying and praying and praying for their boy to be healed, to be reunited with his parents and his siblings. 19 days in the hospital. Father, that's an ongoing, unbelievable level of grief. So, so many people, Father, are, 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 are feeling it. Send your peace, Father, that surpasses all understanding. Send your grace, your mercy, your love, your forgiveness. I thank you, Father, for your goodness. For the joy that you've given me, Father. Outside of the rapture, Father, my prayer for me personally in my life I pray that when I take my last breath, I got a smile on my face. Because you've given me a good life. You've given me a life full of joy.